This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. We're so glad you've joined the people of First Presbyterian Church of Ponca City, Oklahoma for worship today. Wherever you are, we welcome you. You'll find the words to the liturgy and the hymns in subtitles, and you're invited to join us as we worship and pray. So please join me in our opening sentences. Jesus says, where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. Christ is with you, calling us to the water, beckoning us to the feast. Christ is with us. Speaking to our souls, listening to our prayers, Christ is with you. Binding us as one body, sending us out in service, Christ is with us. Jesus says, where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. Christ is with us wherever we are. Let us worship the Lord. The psalmist writes, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. Let us confess our sins together with the assurance that God is quick to forgive. Let us pray. Forgiving God, you teach us to seek reconciliation with those who have wronged us. For above all else, we are to love one another. But we let resentment smolder until anger flares, destroying any chance of peace. We blame others and refuse to repent. Grant us grace, we pray. Make space in our wounded hearts for the possibility of forgiveness and teach us to turn toward others in love as you have turned toward us. Amen. Friends, hear the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Open our eyes that we may see the wonders of your word, and give us grace that we may clearly understand and freely choose the way of your wisdom. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our first scripture today is Romans 13, 8 to 14. Let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. For whoever loves has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and whatever other command there may be are summed up in this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. 
Love does no harm to the neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. And do this understanding the present time. The hour has already come for you to wake up from your slumber because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave decently as in the daytime, not carousing in drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. Rather, close yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of sin. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This morning we read from Matthew's Gospel from the 18th chapter, beginning with verse 15. If another member of the church sins against you, go and point out the fault when the two of you are alone. If the member listens to you, you have regained that one. But if you are not listened to, take one or two others along with you, so that every word may be confirmed by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If the member refuses to listen to them, Tell it to the church. And if the offender refuses to listen even to the church, let such one be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, truly I tell you, if two of you agree on earth about anything you ask, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them the gospel of our Lord. Let's pray together. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Jesus and the 12, he called out as his special students and messengers, his disciples, 
never really had easy breezy relationships. They were not particularly predisposed to get along just perfectly. What's the very first thing that Nathaniel says about Jesus? Could anything good come out of Nazareth? That is probably not a good way to start a relationship. All four Gospels portray Peter as headstrong, a very poor listener, and quick-tempered. At one point, Jesus calls him Satan, and while the term Satan meant something a little different in Hebrew literature and culture than it does in our contemporary American context, it was still no great compliment. The disciples were quick to send people away, to just dismiss them, especially women and children, the sick and the hungry, to behave as though they, the disciples, were important, that they were an exclusive group. Jesus had to remind them that he refused to turn anyone away, even when he was tired and sad over the death of John the Baptist. How many times did he have to instruct the disciples, send the little children to me, give the crowd something to eat? So it makes sense that at some point, Jesus would instruct his disciples, and through them, us, his church, in some basic strategies for relationships. I think it's worth noting as well that these guidelines are basic and they don't encompass every situation. They do not address issues that arise from mental illness. They don't take into consideration that there are predators in the world. Yet these guidelines stand to serve many situations in the church well. One of the problems we have in the church is that we're often pretty nice people with rather good manners. Fine etiquette demands that we decline to point out someone else's error if we can manage to ignore it. For the most part, we make a gallant effort not to offend one another, except there is always that one person in the church who has no filters and delights in pointing out everything that's wrong about everybody and everything, leaving all those with fine manners blushing and speechless. And some have suggested that Southerners in particular are slow to have direct and honest conversations, especially confrontational conversations. It simply is not done in polite Southern society. We ignore the offense until that one evening when we are sipping iced tea on the veranda with our closest friends and we find ourselves finally spilling the details on the offense we have suffered at someone else's hand and we spill it in glorious technicolor detail. Right now, we live in a particularly contentious world where some seem to thrive on fanning the flames of conflict, and the church is not exempt from this cultural phenomenon. We're all tired. We're tired of being isolated. We're tired of taking extra precautions. We have the idea that we could go back to the way life used to be, the way life was last January, but yet, in our heart of hearts, we know things will never go back to the way things were last January. We've learned some new things, and some of those things are good and some are bad. Life moves forward, and we strive to carry the good new habits we have into the future and expand on them. We also have seen that a little change, whether for the good or for the bad, comes with some conflict. And that's true for the church as well. So we could use some guidelines for getting along in the church. We're all human. We all err. We're all in need of grace. And we all need help getting past conflict. So many people in history have turned to Matthew 18. And they've turned it into such a simple set of steps as to give the impression that by following this method, you'll know when you may be finished with the need to forgive or pray for a certain person the three-step plan to intolerance. But little, if anything, in the surrounding verses here lend any credence to the notion that the goal here is to arrive at an end point when we can discontinue the practice of mercy, when we can discontinue living in grace and forgiveness. Instead, this is a blueprint that lays out how always to err on the side of grace. First, Jesus says, go directly to the person who is offended. And that's awkward. We know that. I'd say about 98.9% .9 of church members are non-confrontational conflict avoiders. I am. I'm a lifelong, card-carrying conflict avoider. 
Most of us find conflict excruciating. Unfortunately, there are a few individuals out there who thrive on it. So sometimes we have to face it. Jesus says what contemporary therapists say, don't triangulate. If you have a problem with someone, talk with them directly, not a third party. Don't ask somebody to be a go-between. We get that, but the rest of what Jesus says in this first verse sort of slides by without much attention. Jesus never says that person must repent or confess or even apologize. He just says the person needs to listen. Just listen. They should allow you to vent. They should give you a fair hearing. That's what the word actually means in Greek, to hear. The two parties never have to agree. They simply have to listen to one another. So under this model of resolving conflict, if we're feeling wronged, we are responsible for bringing that concern to the person who wronged us, and they are simply responsible to listen. This person you confront is not going to burst into tears, sob a confession, and say you are right and beg your forgiveness, because there are two sides to every story. So it's hard to be direct and very uncomfortable. We also know, unfortunately, an indirect approach often leads to things like gossip and complaining to those who may not even be connected to the situation. It can lead to passive aggressive behavior. Go to the person yourself, Jesus says. And if that person refuses to hear you, if that person shuts down and refuses to receive you and hear you out, then take along someone else. And then, as a last resort, involve the church. If the offender refuses to listen to the church, then they are as a Gentile or a tax collector. But wait, they're like a tax collector? What does that mean? The gospel we are reading from is named after Matthew. Wasn't Matthew a tax collector? Jesus is the one who is speaking in this passage. How did Jesus treat Gentiles and tax collectors? Did Jesus ever meet a pagan he didn't seem to like? Did Jesus spurn and shun tax collectors and other sinners who fit into these broad categories of people? Of course not. In fact, he got into trouble with the religious establishment of his day precisely because of his routine willingness to flout moralistic convention and associate with these folks. Where would Matthew be if that had been how Jesus operated? In the kingdom of God, Gentiles and tax collectors are still welcome today. So we're not off the hook, even when people refuse to listen to us. When people refuse to listen to us, we have to treat them the way Jesus treated pagans and tax collectors, like Matthew and Zacchaeus and the Syrophoenician woman whose daughter he healed and the Roman centurion whose daughter he healed, and on and on and on. In fact, right here in Matthew, Jesus has just told a parable about one lost sheep that demonstrated, among other things, that God knows no bounds when it comes to seeking out those who stray, who wander, who find themselves in need of his mercy and care. Because tax collectors and pagans abound, even today. Jesus had to help us all think carefully about the situations we would face. When we look closely at this text, we will see the word, if, used repeatedly. It's the same in the Greek text. The word if is used six times. If this, if that. Throughout these verses, Jesus is helping the disciples, and now all of us imagine their way into likely scenarios that would take place, scenarios that would repeat themselves in the life of the church throughout all future times. What this repetition does is clarify the power of forgiveness. Clarify that that power is not only a main task of the church community, it is also one of the church's singularly most powerful expressions of divine grace. Grace has the power to change the world. In Christ, it already has. And it is just this power that the church wields. Grace is our true power. Not making rules and saying who's right or who's wrong. Grace is our power. We handle it with care, but also hold it with no small amount of awe at what the Lord of the church has given to us, the power to bind and loose. 
And although the words on loosing and binding are difficult to understand precisely, we know that what we need to set loose on earth as it is in heaven is a spirit of understanding, forgiveness, and grace. What we need to bind is our inability to let go of the past and to focus our ministry of grace and love on here and now. Our Matthew passage ends with a less obvious notion, but a very important one. A clear support of group thinking over the thinking of individuals. The famous in passage for where two or three of you are gathered in my name, I am there among them, has been cited countless times at small Bible studies and church gatherings as sort of a consolation. But its connection to the previous part of this passage is that through listening, we are challenged to be thoughtful and introspective. Sometimes we may confuse our own views with those of God. Sometimes we have trouble letting go of a thought we've held since childhood. Faith that is never challenged by a new word of God never grows. And God is not through speaking. This idea is the root of our Presbyterian denomination. We have ruling elders and teaching elders, lay and clergy, in order to ensure that no one person can claim to understand God's will. That is only done through careful group discernment. Listening and working with new and different perspectives isn't easy, but it's vital when we think about conflict resolution within the church as well as in other areas of our lives. And it can get awkward. In a culture that has emphasized individuality and uniqueness like few others in history, you may have conversations where you feel like you might as well be talking to a brick wall. Perhaps this is why Jesus tells us to forgive not seven times, but 70 times seven. Being in right relationships within communities is hard work. It's not for the faint of heart, and oftentimes it may not seem worth it to participate in that relationship building. But then we remember God's presence wherever two or three are gathered. And we realize it's within those communities that we see God most clearly. It's within the sacraments, baptism, the sign and seal that we are forever God's hand, in God's hands and belong to a church family, and communion, where we gather for a family meal. It's here that God's presence is most clearly made known to us. It may be easier to just avoid conflicts and troublemakers, but that's not what we're called to do. We're called to love and to listen to our neighbors, and we're called to expect love and a listening ear in return. This is our truest identity as followers of Jesus, and this is the one true gift we have to share with the world. It's the gospel of Jesus, but we must not talk about it. We must demonstrate it in the way we treat one another in a divisive and contentious climate. So may you be a sign of God's grace to others this week. May we all become better listeners and forgivers, and may the peace of Christ be with you today and always. Amen.
This is the table of the risen Christ, and you are welcome here today. Wherever you are, whatever you may be experiencing, this table is intended to help you know the love of God for you and for those around you. So wherever you are, I hope you will take a little piece of bread, a little bit of juice or wine, and join us this morning as we share God's love with one another through these elements. Let us pray together. God of love, pour out your blessing on this bread and cup that they may be a sign of love and hope to all those who partake, wherever they may be today. By your spirit, unite us with one another through Christ that we may glorify you now and forever. Amen. As we come to this table today, we remember that on the night Jesus was handed over, he took a loaf of bread, and when he had blessed it, he broke it and said, this is my body that is for you. As often as you eat this, eat it in remembrance of me. And in the same manner after supper, he took the cup and when he had blessed it, he said, this is the new covenant in my blood. As often as you drink this, drink it in remembrance of me. Taste and see that God is good. And let us pray. God, may these elements that we have shared today nourish us for the work ahead. May they strengthen us to be kind, to be loving, and to be your messengers of grace in our world, now and forever. Amen.
And now may Jesus our Lord and God our Father, who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish them in every good work and word through Jesus Christ our Lord, now and forever. Amen.